So we're continuing our series today for Core Christmas called Christmas in the Neighborhood. Now when we talk about neighborhood, we're talking about literally the people that live around you, but we're also talking about the people in your workplace, um, people that you uh, on the practice field, the people on your campus, in your dorm room, those that live around you in your apartment. And today we're going to look back at an old classic, uh, the classic, I should say, Christmas story. If if you uh, have been in church or if you're familiar with the Christmas story, this is the one that you have probably read most of your life. If you have a Bible, I want you to go to Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, and we're going to focus today on, on the shepherds. And I want to talk to you today about good neighbors and good news. Good neighbors and good news. Wherever you are, turn to somebody and tell them, be a good neighbor and have some good news. Be a good neighbor and have some good news. So Luke chapter two, and if you are new to church, maybe you don't have a Bible, it's okay. Um, throughout the message today, we'll put some scriptures on the screen for you as we go along. Uh, Uversion's a great app. I encourage you to download that app. Uh, in fact, on there, you'll find our reading plan as a church. We're in an Advent reading plan. Uh, we went through hope and peace, and next week, we're gonna be focused on the word joy. So just wanna encourage you to be a, a part of that during the Advent season. So. Today, we're going to focus uh, not specifically on, on the actual birth story, but after Jesus was born, he appears to the shepherds. And this may be a story that you are familiar with, and this is where it is actually found, Luke chapter 2. If you have a Bible, let's go to verse 8. It says this, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, which you would be if you saw an angel. I was looking today, we got a little cute little beautiful angel on the top of our tree. She looks so sweet and so angelic. That is not what angels appeared. They appeared like warriors, okay, like holding lightning in their hands. So there's not an instance in scripture where an angel appeared that somebody went, well, it's so good to see you. No, it, it was great fear and trembling. They were, they were terrified. But the angel reassured them. This is what's so great. This is the power of God. The angels are showing the power of God, but the power of God not to strike them dead, but the power of God to watch over them, to guard over you. I, aren't you glad? I think somebody, you might be glad today for the power of Almighty God, that he's not this sweet, cute, little uh, angelic figure on the top of your Christmas tree, but we've got power on our side. He said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven. Just talked about that. Just told you about that. This is an army praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go, let's go. Come on, turn to somebody and say, let's go. Let's, let's go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Today, again, I wanna to talk to you about good neighbors and good news. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for everybody, wherever they are gathered, with their friends, uh, with family this morning, today, tonight, whenever anybody might be watching this, we are just grateful that somehow through technology and through the power of your spirit, although we are not together, God, that you would unite us together and your spirit would speak today and that you'd bring hope, that you'd bring healing, that you'd bring peace and you'd bring purpose to all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Wherever you are, you said what? A men. Well, we have all uh, had a bad neighbor, or, or maybe, maybe right now you, you have a bad neighbor. I mean, somebody that is, you know, difficult to get along with, um, you know, hard to be around, uh, you know, just, just not, e not easy to get, to get along with. We've all had that neighbor. When, when Laura and I moved to Tulsa, years and years ago, when we moved to Tulsa, we unloaded the truck and we had planned to go on vacation, and so we unloaded the truck, and we had two dogs, and we put the dogs in the backyard, food and water. And, and now this, is, by the way, is back in the day when dogs used to be in the backyard. Did anybody remember when we used to actually keep dogs outside? That used to be a thing. Now if you hear a dog outside, you're like, oh, my goodness, they are so cruel. That is awful. I can't believe they treat an animal such a way. But, 
But back in the day, dogs were never in the house. They were, they were always outside. And so we had some relatives that were in town and they were coming to check on the dogs. They were going to be fine. So we went, went on a vacation. We came back. And when we came back, we got a knock on the door and it was the SPCA. And I was, can I help you? And the guy's like, yeah, we, uh, we got a report from one of your neighbors that uh, maybe you uh, have been uh, not taking care of your animals. And I was like, wait, what? Yes, sir, that you've abandoned them? And I'm like, wait, no, no. And I explained to him what I just told you. We just moved in and family, blah, blah, blah. And, and he says, well, I'm going to need to see these dogs. I'm like, really? Okay. So he comes in, he looks at the dogs. He sees that they're fine. And he's like, sir, I'm, I'm sorry to bother you. And, and, and he leaves. Come to find out, it was the older lady, I'm going to say this as nice as I can because I am a preacher and this is going into the archives, but it was the older lady across the street. She affectionately started to become known as Cat Lady. Anybody got one of those in your neighborhood? Yeah, she was Cat Lady. Every cat in the neighborhood converged on her house. We saw cats in the windows, on the roofs, under cars. I'm not kidding you. A, a lot, a lot of cats. And this lady called the SBC, hey, I went over and talked to her, and she was just like, well, you just need to be taking care of your animals. And I'm like, we are taking care of our animals. And this lady just kept on after it. She would watch our kids from her window. She'd be like through her curtains. I'm like, I don't know if that was her voice or not, but her name was Esmeralda. She, so this lady, though, she was not much fun to have as a neighbor. I think we've all had that neighbor, or maybe you have that neighbor right now. And it's easy to spot the bad neighbor, but what, is it, what does it mean to be a good neighbor? Like, to be a good neighbor, does that mean, like, you, you, you wave, you say hi, you take care of your lawn, you let people borrow stuff? I mean, yes, I would say that's absolutely what makes a good neighbor. But as followers of Jesus, we understand as neighbors, we have a greater responsibility. That's, we've been talking about that in this series and we see what our responsibility is when the angel first appeared. In, in Luke 2.10, the angel said this, I bring you, say this with me, good news that will bring great joy to all people. As followers of Jesus, we bring the good news. Turn to somebody and tell them you're bringing good news. You're bringing good news. Like we are bringing hope to people healing to people who are broken, peace to people who are overwhelmed, purpose to people like we just talked about with Buddy Davis and, and, and Abba Center. That's who we are. That's why we exist. And we're taking that into our neighborhoods, our workplaces, on, onto our, our campuses and into our dorm rooms and into our apartments, wherever we are. I'd, I'd like for you to write this down because this is what I want to talk about for a few minutes. A good neighbor brings good news that brings great joy. A good neighbor brings good news that brings great joy. So let's go back to Luke chapter two, because in Luke chapter two, we see that the, the shepherds give us a, a great example of what it means to be a, a good neighbor. Look again at, at verse eight. It says this, that night there were shepherds, say it with me, staying in the fields nearby. And, and they, were, they were guarding their flocks of sheep. Like, this is who we are as followers of Jesus. We are all called to be shepherds. And I said this last week, we were all missionaries on mission, assigned to a mission field. Like, you and I are shepherds, and our mission field is to those who are nearby. Think about it. The announcement of the birth of the Messiah didn't happen in the temple. It didn't take place in, in the church, which that would make more sense, wouldn't it? Like, God has arrived. Where would you make that announcement? You would make it in the church, but it wasn't made in the church. It was made in the neighborhood. It was made in, in the fields nearby. So what if we lived as people who are called, who, who are sent to fields nearby? by, to our neighbors, to our workplaces, onto our campuses. How would that affect our lives? How would we live our lives differently? Well, first of all, we see this, that the shepherds, they, they stayed. 
They stayed in the fields. In, in other words, the shepherds, as a shepherd, they knew they had a responsibility to these sheep. They're, they were not going to abandon the sheep. I mean, when Laura and I, a few years ago, we went to Israel and, and we um, saw the shepherds. And I, when I read the story of the shepherds, it looks kind of glamorous to me. I just envision a starry night and, and you know, fields, green fields, and just a warm, it ain't nothing like that. We, we were on this bus traveling, and the majority of the shepherds are out in the, in the countryside, a.k.a. the wilderness. I mean, they are out in the elements. It is rocky. It is barren. It is not much to look at. They are exposed to the elements. I just imagine the, the shepherds are like sitting around a fire at night, and they're like, I think I'm going to go be a barista at Starbucks. I, I just think that's what's on their mind. Like, they don't want to be doing this because it's hard work. Here's the thing. Staying in the field where God has placed you isn't always easy or convenient. I mean, just logistically, sometimes the home that you're living in, it just gets too small and you need, you need a bigger house. Sometimes the neighborhood you live in gets a little bit sketchy and you're like, can we stay here? Sometimes the class you're in, it's it gets pretty difficult, and you don't know if you can, man, I don't think I'm going to pass this class. i gotta, I got to opt out of this class. Sometimes the workplace that you're in becomes very, very difficult. The workload is hard. It's not what you envisioned it to be. And the people that you're surrounded with, come on, somebody, the people that you're surrounded with are difficult. They're, they're ungodly, the way that they're treating you, the way that they're treating one another. It's not easy to stay in the field. But here's the thing. I, I'm not saying... That you should never move. But what if, like the shepherds, God has called you to stay in the field? Could it be that God has placed you in that field for a purpose, on purpose, for a purpose? Somebody nearby you needs the good news that will bring great joy. And could it be that God is counting on you and that's why he put you where you are in the very place you're trying to leave, to exit from, God is saying, no, no, no. I want you to stay in that field. We read out of the New Living Translation a lot here, but the New American Standard Version in this story, it says they were keeping watch over their flock. I, I don't know if you have a neighborhood watch in your neighborhood. Uh, we don't have one in ours, um, but at least we, 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 I didn't think we did, but, but somehow Laura and uh, our neighbor three doors down, Cheryl, they have somehow uh, appointed themselves as co-presidents of the neighborhood watch. Like there wasn't any vote that happened. They just appointed themselves and they just started doing it. And they, they, they're watching everybody. Like my wife, Laura, when she goes, she goes out to walk Otis every night, but <laughs> trust me, she ain't going out to walk. She's going out to watch. I, I have been on one of these watches. I mean, walks. I, I have been out with her before. And I, I, this is an exact quote. We're rounding the corner and she points out to the house. She kind of does this. She doesn't really point. She goes, um, right over there, um, those people, there is a lot going on in that house. Mm -hmm. A lot of cars coming and going. And I'm like, Honey, you you sound like the cat lady we used to. It's, here's the thing: some some people are God's self-appointed neighborhood watch. Like they they feel like they're supposed to be watching over people. Oh my goodness, look at them! They're just living in sin. Oh, you know they're smoking them doobies. Oh my goodness, I can't believe the way that they're living. That's uh, unbelievable. I mean, but haven't. Haven't we all been guilty of that? So this word watch over, like as the shepherds here, it's not this idea of lording it over people, that I am supposed to be God to other people. No, no, it's actually the complete opposite of that. Watching over actually means that you would come under, that you would, you would serve, that you would help, that you would, you would support, that you would care for those around you. If you're taking notes, write this down. First of all, shepherds, they feed the sheep. If you're gonna care for people, you gotta feed 
the sheep. Shepherds feed the sheep. So the question I want to ask you this is, what are you feeding people? Jesus, after his resurrection, he appeared to his disciples, and he said to Peter several times, he said, do you love me? And Peter's like, yeah. And he said, feed my sheep. And he's, okay. And then Jesus asked him again, he asked him again, he asked him again, and do you love me? And Peter's like, yes, then, then feed my sheep. In my backyard, the last couple of years, I've gotten a, a bird feeder because I wanted to attract the birds. And I don't know if you've ever had a bird feeder. I've never had one before, but I thought, this would be cool to have some birds coming into my, into my yard and into my garden. And, and, uh, and sure enough, here, they, they were coming. But what, it wasn't just the birds that were coming. The bird feeder also attracted the squirrels in the neighborhood. And oh, then it was on. It was the battle between the squirrels and me. I mean, they were emptying the bird feeders where the birds couldn't get it. I was so frustrated about this. And I, I don't, don't, don't put in the chat, don't, don't text me or email me and say, Brad, I've got, I, I can tell you exactly how to get rid of them squirrels. I have tried everything. I put cayenne pepper in the bird feeder, which sounds awful, but birds don't care, and, but it's supposed to affect squirrels. You know what this squirrel did? He got in and he was looking at me like, ooh, I like it spicy. I mean, he was just mocking me. I looked up on my bird feeder, he had pulled the top off and he was just digging down, just chowing down like it was a buffet. And so I went and I got these clips and I, and I clipped it closed so he couldn't get in. Then I look out there, he's hanging upside down, hanging upside down, digging out of the bird feeder. I'm like, I am so frustrated. Somebody said, put Vaseline on the pole. That, then he can't get up the pole. So I did, but I one upped him. I said, you know what? I'm gonna put Vicks 44 on that bad boy because I thought if he gets it on his paws, it'll just irritate him. I look out there, that squirrel, I'm not kidding. If I'm lying, I'm dying. He's taking, he's rubbing it on his chest. He's like, whoo, thank you so much. I've got a little bit of congestion. I feel much better. Thank you, my friend. I was, it's so frustrating. I've tried everything. And then I decided I was gonna change my tactic. I was gonna change the way I approached it. I thought, okay. What if I started feeding the squirrels? And so I heard somebody did this. You get these dried corn cobs, and I set up a separate feeder for the squirrels. And I started feeding them this corn cob. Now, I'd love to tell you that they completely ignore the bird feeders now. That's not really true. They, they hang out over here most of the time, and, and, and they're spending less time at the bird feeder. So listen, I want you to just think for a moment. Who is it in your life? It's like that squirrel to you. They just irritate you. You wish you could just, wish they just move on. Now, I want you to share that with somebody around you. I don't want to, it, it might be the person around you. So don't say their name. Don't say their name. But just for a moment, would you share, like, who is it that's kind of pushing your buttons? Take a moment, share that wherever you are. So what are you feeding them? True, there's many times we're feeding them disdain, we're feeding them frustration, we're giving them the cold shoulder, we're trying to push them away, or worse yet, we're, we're talking about them when they're not around, which is, I think, sometimes worse than the way we treat people when they are around. What if you changed your tactic? What if you did something a little bit different? Solomon, in the book of Proverbs, he talks about this idea that Hey, if your enemy is thirsty, give them something to drink. If your enemy is hungry, give them something to eat. And, and Paul kind of backs this up in the book of Romans. He quotes Solomon as well. And Jesus talks about our enemies and those who that we should help them. So what if you began to feed them kindness? I'm not saying it's easy. But what if you started feeding them kindness? What if you started feeding them peace? What if you started feeding them hope? What if you started feeding them grace and feeding them mercy? What, what might God do through that? Because a good neighbor brings good news that brings great joy. And I believe Jesus is asking us, do you love me? And of course, our answer is yes. Yes, Lord, we we love you. 
And I think Jesus' response is, then don't, don't, then don't poison my sheep, feed my sheep. So a shepherd feeds the sheep. Here's the next thing I'd like for you to write down. Shepherds lead the sheep. Do you see how I did that? Rhymed a little something there. Yeah, that's, that's a little good preacher thing there. Yeah, they feed the sheep. Shepherds also lead the sheep. So the question is this, where are you leading people? Psalm chapter 23 talks about uh, the most famous psalm in, in all of scripture, maybe one of the most famous scriptures in all of the Bible begins by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. And we're supposed to be following the example of the Lord. So it says, the Lord is my shepherd. And then it goes on to say this, he leads me beside peaceful streams. 2020 has been anything but peaceful. I mean, it has been chaotic. There has been confusion. There has been resentment and anger and frustration and discouragement. Where are you leading people? As followers of Jesus, we have a responsibility to lead people to peaceful streams. Peace is not coming on January 20th. Peace is not coming with a vaccine. Peace is not coming just because your kids go back to school. Peace is not coming because the economy recovers. No, peace has already come. Peace came 2,000 years ago in the form of a baby. Jesus has come, and the, the angels announced it. They proclaimed it. They said the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord has been born in Bethlehem. So when you look at your, your neighborhood, when you look out at your neighborhood, I, I think truth is everything appears peaceful. Like you, you look out and you see your neighbor, he's, he's, he's got that truck, he's got an Amazon package showing up uh, every other day. He just, he's living the dream, he's, everything's going great for him. Man, it, it, you, like you look on Instagram and, and you see that, that young girl, she's, she's posting those pictures and she's at the party and she's always hanging out with her friends and, and she's always got something, you know, some bling on. She's always looking good and smiling and happy. And, or you see that older couple that's walking their, their little wind-up dog on the leash. She's got a little sweater on and they're, they're walking. They just look so cute. People are not okay. We've got to recognize that people are not hashtag living the dream. The truth is people are confused and they're, they're dealing with self-doubt. They're just not going to let you, you see it. Because what you, what you don't see is that, that guy that, 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 that's got the truck, he's got the Amazon packages showing up every other day. What you don't see is him at his kitchen table late at night and he's just kind of like, how am I going to pay for this? Christmas is coming. Um, what am I going to do? That young girl with all the great pictures on the Insta story, what you don't see is her in her room scrolling through all the pictures she took that day, endlessly 40, 50, 60 pictures, just trying to find the right picture because if I post the right picture, Maybe somebody will like me. Maybe somebody will notice me. Maybe it'll, somebody will help me to feel like I have value and I have worth. That older couple that looks so cute walking their little dog, what you don't see is when they go behind closed doors, that they're thinking back on all the wasted years, all the years of disappointment, all the years of heartache and thinking, is this it? Is this really how it ends? Is this is how, how it's going to go down? At the end of the story of, of the shepherds, it says these words in verse 20. The shepherds went back to their flocks. Come on, turn to somebody and tell them it's, it's time to go back. It's time to go back. Back. They, they didn't stay at the manger. They went and saw Jesus. They could have stayed there. Nobody would blame them for staying there, but they said, no, we cannot stay here. They went out and they told everyone the good news. Everyone, anyone that would listen, they shared that good news. And then they went back to their field. Listen, today, all of us have come and we have experienced the presence of God. We've experienced the, the power of God. And it'd be so easy to camp out here. It'd be so easy to just live here. 
But God is calling us to go. To go out to the, to the fields nearby, to go back into our fields, to go back into our neighborhoods, to go back into our workplaces, to go back onto our campuses because you and I are called to be good neighbors because we have good news that will bring great joy.